Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be an explorer. I wanted to find things that nobody had found before. And you know, when I was young, they went to the bathyscaphe and the lowest parts of the ocean. And so that was kind of, I couldn't do that. And they discovered the North Pole hundreds of years ago. And um, I just, I've always been intri intrigued by old things, by ancient things. And uh, I loved Egypt as a child. I loved uh, uh, mysteries. And, and I found that I had a facility for writing. I loved to, to draw uh, letters and hieroglyphs and things like that. And there's just so much still to discover about the Maya. Uh, as a person who studied history of writing, I was always intrigued by the ancient writing of China and the ancient writing of Egypt and Crete and, and uh, runes and, you know, sort of runes. The word runes means mysteries. And, and I love the sort of mystery of things like that. And when I discovered first that Maya was undeciphered and second that it was a Native American script, that it was on my side of the Atlantic, I thought this is this is great. This is this is more. Uh, this, I'm sort of patriotic about Maya being on this continent and not, and not an old world uh, script. Um, but the best thing about um, Maya writing and studying Maya culture as a as an archaeologist or as an epigrapher is um, there's so much more still to discover. You visit Tikal. They've been digging in Tikal since the 1930s. Tikal has 4,000 stone buildings that we know are there, just from the sort of heaps of the Maya sites tend to be humps of earth in the jungle covered with trees. And you dig down, and you find there's a stone building inside. Tikal has 4,000 of those, and they've dug about 60. So Tikal is like 1.5% penetrated. And the, the rest of it's still to be discovered. And in fact, even in major sites, they sort of expose the pyramid, and sometimes they'll tunnel in. but the pyramids are layered, you know, and inside each pyramid is a smaller pyramid going down to 50 BC or sometimes older. And um, many pyramids have seven, eight, 15 layers. I think Tikal, there's, a, there's, a, there's an animation of the layers of Tikal's Acropolis, and I think there are 18 different building programs over the 700 or 800 years that they, they worked there. And there's so little solid, deep archaeology in places like this. Uh, like I said, they've been working on Tikal for years, and they've only done just 1.5 percent. There's so much more to be discovered. At Palenque in 1999, Alfonso discovered Temple 19 had this fabulous bench. They weren't sure if it was a throne or a packing crate, but it has these carvings on two sides that talk about the time before creation, um, what the gods were doing that's related to what the king was doing. And, and it turns out that Akal Monab, the king that built um, Temple 19 and Temple 18 and maybe Temple 17 um, was a major Palenque king. Nobody knew that before before uh, these temples were dug up. And uh, he wasn't as great as King Pakal, the famous guy in the Temple of the Inscriptions, the, t the tomb that was like the Mexican King Tut. Um, but but um, the, it turned, you know, 1999, I was just, I was working with Alfonso on, on that dig. Well, my favorite story from the field was when I went to the Palen into the Palenque Aqueduct. The, um, the, the palace has this large plaza in front of it and a river running right through the plaza, which they roofed over to make the plaza level. And so there's this, this tunnel through the plaza with stone, stone roof, uh, it's a corbelled arch, which is a, a pointed uh, stone arch. And you can wade through the aqueduct. And, and I went in there and I was attacked by bats. And that was kind of fun to be. Uh, <laughs> Vampire bats were very important to the Maya because the Maya loved any creature that could travel between worlds. And a vampire bat, of course, lives in a cave. It looks like a mammal, but it can fly. Uh, and it, uh, blood was very important to them. They, they felt the gods were fed by blood. And so a vampire bat, they thought, was some sort of emissary for the gods collecting taxes or something. Not only did they not say the world would end in 2012, they said the world would go on. Um, I want to say that the whole basis of the idea that Maya calendar comes to an end in 2012 is that the date that the Maya say, according to the Maya calendar, the date of, of December 21st or 23rd, 2012, is a, a big round number. It's 13 followed by four zeros, 13, zero, 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 zero. 
And that date is identical to the date that the Maya called the date of their creation. And you know how a clock reaches 12 and then it becomes zero again and becomes 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock? The Maya calendar 5,000 years ago was at the number 13, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then it started over, and that was our creation. That's the way that they portrayed it. And so some people, many people, have said that um, the calendar will start again, the world will be created anew in 2012. In 13 zero, 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 zero. But in Palenque, there's an inscription that says it's going to go to 14, to 15, to 16, and go on up to 20. And in fact, in the year when it, when it reaches 20, then, the, then it becomes a six digit number, right? Instead of being 13 zero, 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 it becomes 1 zero, 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 zero. And that date is the year 4772 AD. And eight days after that date will be the anniversary of the crowning of King Pakal, the king who's buried in the Temple of the Inscriptions. And they said on his tomb that in the year 4772 that we, we would be celebrating the anniversary of King Pakal's coronation, which says, A, the calendar doesn't end in 2012. Life goes on you know, past 1300 to, to, to 2000 and, and, and beyond. And that eight days after that, the people would doing, be doing the same thing as they were doing. This is my book on 2012. I wrote this book because when we first started to hear about the 2012 stuff that the Maya calendar would end, everybody that was talking about it was making stuff up, was attaching it to Atlantis and to the Egyptians and to the Pleiades and to their own, again, their own fantasies of, of their own lives ending. And then you started to hear people saying, well, it's not the end of anything. It's actually a new beginning, that there's going to be a better world, and that uh, the gods have decreed that this world will end and a new, new world will begin. And, uh, and they kept saying, the Maya predicted the end of this world. And all of my colleagues, all the archaeologists, and epigraphers and people I know said, this is crap. It's the Maya didn't say this. And, um, they, they were saying things like, you know, why are they, this is just ridiculous. It's, it's, it's putting, it's, it's misinterpretation of the mind and so forth. And I said, well, this sounds like an opportunity to, uh, to educate people about the Maya. And my colleagues, for the most part, said, I'm not going to touch this. This is, this is, this is like wrestling with a pig. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, and I said, no, this is a great opportunity to spotlight the real Maya. And my book started out as an examination of all the information that we have about the ancient Maya prophecies, whether they predicted an end, um, explaining the calendar, and, and then it grew into sort of, of you know, as, you, as you're looking for any sort of, uh, one of the great things about this kind of work is you start with one purpose and you discover all these other things along the way. And so it's a bunch of essays about 2012, about the calendar, about prophecy, and then about the things I discovered about, about the Maya and their, um, their world view. I, th I think this is probably a total accident, but the writing of the Egyptians is very, what should I say, it's unchanging. It's very thin and dry. The glyphs stand separate from each other like desert plants, like, you know, thorny bushes in, in, the, in the desert. Maya glyphs are like jungle growth. They're like mashed together and they're really complicated and, they, and you can't tell them apart. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting coincidence.